So do you remember then, we made reference to it in our praise, that there's a cry in this chapter to behold your God. And uh, that voice crying out, behold your God, is in the middle of a book called the Book of Comfort. So Isaiah's ministry lasted 40 years. He's one of the great Old Testament prophets. And he has just announced that the people of Israel are going to be taken captive to Babylon. He, that's chapter 39. And then as soon as he has preached that sermon, he brings in this message, behold your God. And it's in this book of comfort that starts in chapter 40, verse 1, and that extends then to chapter 42 and verse 17. And we're going to look at this book of comfort. We may do it all, we may not, who knows? It seems to me that these days I can't even stick to a plan that I've made um, with a newsletter. So who knows how uh, things will work out? But we are beholding God, and first we see God as the creator God. And so chapter 40 holds a series of portraits of God as the creator, this glorious eternal God who is our God. And then in chapter 41, we see God as the God in control of all the nations, the God who commands the nations, who rules over the kings and the, the princes of the world. The God who is working out his purposes in history, chapter 41. So this is a book of comfort for God's people. And then what happens is, as we go into chapter 41, God commands the nations of the world to listen to him. And so from the middle of chapter 41 into chapter 42, God speaks to the gods of the world. And he calls them idols. And he tells them that they're useless. And he says that what these false gods can't do is they cannot bring about the future. They cannot work out their plans and execute their purposes. So we then are looking at this command to behold your God. And as you come to the end of the chapter, what you have in verses 30 and 31 are two ways of looking at life. They are two ways of experiencing life. So if you like, let's call it life experience. And there are two sorts of life experiences that's on offer for us today. And what I'm hoping is this, that whatever we listen to in the sermon, whatever we forget, we hold on to this idea that there are two ways of experiencing life. The first way is found in verse 30, where Isaiah talks about youths and young men. Now, that's the first way of looking at life. And then the second way of looking at life is found in mention of the weak and those who have no strength so at the end of verse 28 we read there god gives power beginning of verse 29 god gives power to the weak and to those who have no might he increases strength so here's what i want you to do let's imagine that here we have the young men and the youths and we said last sunday that the hebrew term can refer to athletes at the peak of physical fitness the word could mean an, a, a warrior, a soldier, trained and strong and mighty. These are the youths. And then over here, we've got the weak and we've got those who are without strength. Now, both of these can experience life in a certain way. What do we find? Look at verse 31. Verse 30, sorry. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. So here are perfect physical specimens, young and strong and fit. And what Isaiah uses are two words to describe how such can experience life. And the two words are weary and fall. 
And I want to spend a minute or two discussing both words with you. So let's imagine, it's not difficult. We've got pictures of soldiers on our TV screens uh, nearly every day now. We've recently had the Winter Olympics. So it's not gonna be hard, is it, to imagine physically fit, strong, young, fine specimens of humanity. What Isaiah tells us is this, even they can be weak. Now the word weak that you see in verse 30, weary, you may have it in your translation. It's a word that refers to your inner sense of things. It's a word that can be described as dread. And I want to spell it out like this. This word weary, it starts with a thought. And it's a thought of something that you're facing. So I want you to identify a thought that is relevant to your experience, a thought that is linked to something that you're about to face, that may be happening tomorrow, that could happen to you next week. You know it's there, you know it's on the horizon, you know it's going to happen, but it's not yet, it's in the future. So I want you to identify that for yourself. And I want you, as you identify it, to tap into how you feel. As you bring that thought to mind, what goes on inside for you? So for some people, it's the thought of work tomorrow. So we know work will happen. It's tomorrow. The weekend has gone quickly. And the thought of work causes dread. It causes that feeling of anxiety. That's weariness. And it may not be work, because many of you are retired. I think I know some of you well enough to know what you're dreading. Some of you are dreading tomorrow and what tomorrow may bring. Some of you are dreading the rest of the time you've got because you feel you're on your own now. Identify that thought there and tap into that feeling. That's the word weary. That's what it means. You don't feel up to it. You don't feel you've got the strength required of you to face it. As you think of your own resources, you feel a sense of lack, an emptiness. This thing that you're facing, it's so big, it feels so bleak, it's, it's so, uh, such a mystery, it's unsolvable. It's stretching out, there it is, and in your thoughts it's big and it's scary and it's dark. And then you feel, as you compare yourself to it, as you measure yourself against it, you feel you're not up to it. You haven't got what it takes. You don't have in the bank enough resources to, to meet the challenge. That is the word we read here in uh, Isaiah 40. And listen to what Isaiah says. Even the youths, shall faint and be weary. So if those most perfect human beings with youth and strength and power on their side, if even they can feel like that, how much more are we going to feel like that? These young people with all the strength of their training and their discipline, their physical fitness, if they feel that sense of I'm not up to it and I'm not equal to it and I can't face it, then how much more the rest of us? That's Isaiah's point here. So would all of you agree with this? Can you see it in your own experience? I, I don't want to tell you what you're dreading. I want you to identify what it is you're now dreading. And I'm trying to hold back because, because I know what some of you are going through. I, I want to help you to see what I'm saying. So I'm tempted to give an example and then you'll tell me off because you'll say, Neil, you shouldn't let everybody know what's going on for me. 
So I'm going to hold back. And I'm hoping now that you can make this connection for yourself. So just to be sure, there's two bits to it. There's the thought of something yet to come, looming on the horizon for you, stretching out before you. There it is. And you don't feel up to it. That's weariness. Now, that's the first way to experience life. You can go through life like this. Every time there's a demand and every time there's a challenge and every time there's an uncertainty and every time there's a responsibility, you face it and you fear it and you dread it and you feel unequal to it. You can go through life like that. And then you've got this second part of the verse. The young men shall utterly fall. Now, this isn't inside now so much. It's not that sense of dread and you don't feel equal. It's not so much that. This phrase is to do with life itself. It's to do with on the outside. And this Hebrew word refers to the fact that life can be a series of challenges. It can be one after another, after another. It's layer upon layer. You think one thing is sorted out and then another comes along. And then you sort that out. And then out of the blue comes a third and you weren't expecting it. And you're beginning to feel, well, well, when will this end? I've sorted this out. I've sorted that out. Now there's another thing. Uh, will it all be okay then? Will I have some peace then? And you sort out number three. And then lo and behold, there's another another one and another one it's layer after layer after layer after layer of challenge and difficulty whatever word you want to put there that's this word it's when life presents you with a whole series of challenges and it is often one after the other but there are times when it can all be at once so suddenly you're facing a whole series of different challenges. Now, when that happens in life, when life's experience is like that, then you can begin to feel that you're not up to it, that you're not equal to it. That's what the word fail means uh, at the end of verse 30. So do you see the difference between the two? First is that inner sense of dread. And the second is one thing after another. You may have illness, and then there's a, a problem at work, and then something's going on with the kids, and, and then the house develops a leak or whatever it is. It's one thing after another, and you begin to say, this is the word fail. When will it end? When will I have some peace? When will I be left alone? It's that kind of sense. Now, the youths feel like that again this is the idea that even if young people can feel that life is all a whole series of challenges how much more the rest of us now that's one way of living life okay you're relying on your strength and on your youth and on your training that's one way of experiencing life so what's the second way well, take a look back to verse 29. And uh, for whatever reason, they're over here, aren't they? Uh, on my uh, left hand side, there is a, another way of experiencing life. And it's the way that the weary and the weak live life. And how do they live life? Listen to verse 31. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up with wings like eagles they shall run and not be weary they shall walk and not faint now i want to encourage you to to try and make sense of what i'm about to say so here's the weak and here's those who are without strength how do they live life and the way they live life is summed up in one word and that word we've had in Psalm 103. You'll have the word in Psalm 33. It's the same word that Jesus in Matthew 11 says, come unto me, ye weary. It's the same idea. 
the one way that the weak live life and experience life is through the word wait. Those who wait on the Lord. So those, the weak, the ones without strength, they engage with life by waiting on the Lord. And I want to end with a definition of waiting. And it just so happens that we can give it three meanings, okay? So the, f the first is this idea of resting. Waiting means resting. And resting is the opposite of working. Okay, now stay with me. Try and follow what I'm saying. God worked six days and he rested on the seventh. This word wait means to rest. And it's the opposite of working. Now, most of you spend too much time working. And I don't mean, you know, your job. I've said already, some are retired. What most of you do is you spend too much time working in terms of your mind. You spend too much time thinking about how everything's going to work out. How can we solve it all? How can I meet that challenge? How will I be up to it? What can we do about it? So this word, wait on the Lord, it means to rest. Stop trying to work it all out and put it all together. Now, some of you will say, well, Neil, we've got to do that. Surely we've got to do that. And there's a very real difference between choosing to sit down and you're sitting at your table and you've got your pen and you've got your paper and you're solving a problem. That's fine. But this kind of working is when you can't sleep at night. Or when you're driving and you're distracted, not too much. Or you're doing the dishes. Whatever it is, this kind of working is when you're sitting there and your mind is stuck on it. And it's going round and round and round and round. And you're looking at everything and you're, you're trying to consider everything. And, and you end up coming to nothing. That's the work that you're invited to stop. Don't live like that. Don't experience life like that. Wait. Rest. Rest from all that mental turmoil, all that mental anguish as you try to make sense of something. You try to discern something. You try to find out where God is in something. Stop all that. Rest from that. That's what the word wait means. And what we'll see is we want someone else to do all that work for us. So this word, it means to stop working, to rest. It then means to trust. So whom will you trust? And this is a very real difference now in Isaiah. The youths and the young men, as they face tomorrow, or challenge after challenge after challenge, where's their confidence then? Well, they go into trust, aren't they, in their bodies, in their training, in their discipline. They're going to trust in their physical uh, strength. Their trust will be in all their preparation. All the hard work that they've put in. They'll trust their weapons if they're soldiers. So trust is centered around the self. It's centered around the person. All your skills and your knowledge and your experience and your training. It's centered very firmly on you. Now that, says Isaiah, experiencing life like that will result in weariness and failure. 
the trust that marks the weak and the trust that marks those who are without strength is the trust that is demonstrated in waiting on the Lord. You see it there, don't you? Listen again to verse 30. Those who wait on the Lord. Now, there is the trust. It's outside of myself. I'm extending my trust to one who is greater than I am, to one who is the maker of heaven and earth, to the one who stretches out the heavens like a curtain. I'm taking my trust and confidence outside of myself, and I'm placing it squarely on the one who knows each star by name, who never is weary and who never faints. So waiting on the Lord, it means stop working, stop doing all that mental anguish and turmoil and running around like some sort of rat in a trap trying to make sense of everything. Stop that. Take your trust and your confidence onto something greater than you, someone bigger than you. Place your confidence there. And then the third idea of waiting, which the word itself captures then, is the idea of God will do it. The Lord has it. The Lord knows it. That's the idea. Okay? Can you see the progression? You stop all that noise that's going on in your brains. That noise is getting you knowing. It's got you knowing. In fact, all the years you've spent generating all that activity in your head that has led to absolutely no way has made you weary. Stop that. Rest from it. And then as you rest from it, let your confidence lie with God. And look at how God is described. Have you not known? He is the everlasting God. He is the one who is the Lord. He is the creator of the ends of the earth. Where do you want your confidence to be? And if our confidence is in him, what's the result? But if we remain focused and centered on the self and our confidence there, well, we know, don't we? what the result of that will be. So it's stop working, place your confidence, and then the hardest thing for any human being to do is just wait. Don't you find it hard to wait? And I'm not talking now about, you know, waiting for the birthday present or, you know, whatever. Don't you just find it hard to wait when it comes to life? And the experience of life. The hardest thing is to be still and to wait because we want to know and we want to be in control and we want to find out and we want to be certain. So here is this idea of just wait. I'm going to put it like this, and it's a really bad example. When you're watching TV and you're watching some thrill, thriller, let's imagine that, okay? So you're watching, could be a film or it could be a series. And as you're watching the drama play out, you, you don't have a clue what's going on. And you're sitting there and you're thinking, oh, who's that character now? And, and how does she fit into the drama? And, and what did he just say now? Uh, and what's he going to do? And there you are. You've got no idea what's happening. And you want to know. So you want to know why she just said that. And, and why has he got a briefcase? And, and what's he doing there? And the answer is just wait. And it'll all be revealed to you. Just wait. The plot has to develop. The characters have to come and go. The story has to continue. Wait. And that comes close to the Hebrew idea of wait. In your life, 
You want to know. And you want to know how you'll be. And will you manage? And are you going to cope? And will it be okay? And can you do what you want to do? And will this plan work out? And you, you want to know all these things. And your mind is in this turmoil. And here comes the voice of God. Wait. Live with not knowing. Live with uncertainty. Live with as much as you know right now. Because all you need to know, you know right now. And whatever you need to know tomorrow, you'll know tomorrow. You won't know it today. And it doesn't matter how much you try or how long you think or how much you plan, you will not know today what you can only know tomorrow. So wait, wait for the one who knows tomorrow, who's already planned it out, and who surrounds tomorrow with all his promises of his grace and his presence and his strength, that he's working all things out for good to those who love him. Wait. And if you can wait, then what Isaiah does is this. He tells you the most wonderful picture of what life will be like. So are you ready for the last bit? Two ways of living. There's the youths in a dread, challenge after challenge, we're not up to it. And then there's the weak and with those without strength. And as they live life, their life is marked by waiting. So the resting their heads, confidence is in the Lord, and they're just waiting, waiting with uncertainty. What's the result? Well, verse 31 ends like this, and it ends with a picture of what's described as renewal. If you live by waiting on the Lord, then your experience of life will be one of renewal. Now, I'm saying this to myself as much as I am to you. We are all learning things at the same time, aren't we? I'm no different. I'm no better. We learn together. So if I can learn to experience life by waiting, this is what life will be like. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary they shall walk and not faint. Now, that's a description of renewal. And now and again, I managed to make points beginning with the same letter. I can't do it to end this sermon. I've got two, but not three. If I can live and experience life by waiting, then the first thing that I will know is rising. I will rise up on wings like the eagle. And then the second way that I'll experience life is this. I will run and not be weary. And then the third way that I shall experience life, and if you can do it, please find a letter R word. I will walk and not be faint. So these three become the way that I experience life. And it's because I wait on the Lord. So I rise up on the wings of an eagle. We saw that in Psalm 103. It's a reference to Moses and how Moses brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. And he caused them to cross the Red Sea. And they came to Mount Sinai on the third day. And God says, when they arrived, I have brought you on the wings of an eagle. That's the background to that phrase, I will rise. That's how I'll experience life. If I can wait, then I can rise. I can then run. Listen to it again in verse 30. They shall run and not be weary. There's that word again. And then finally, they shall walk and not faint. Now, I want to make a suggestion as we come to an end. 
all of us, I think, find it difficult to keep in our minds, don't we? Um, a sermon that we've heard. And by the end of a Sunday, we've often forgotten, and that's fine, absolutely fine. It's very difficult to do that from one Sunday to the next. So this is my suggestion. If you look at the, the uh, end of verse, well, look at verse 31 as a whole. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength, mounting up on wings like eagles, running and not be weary, walking and not fainting. Do you see <clears throat> that that is linked to our description of God that you find in verse 28? Look at verse 28. Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. So there's that clear link between a God who doesn't faint and isn't weary and youths fainting. And then if we wait on him, we won't faint and we won't be weary. So what we end is with this. We have a description of God here. We've described the youths, we've described the weak, but we've got a description of God in the middle. And if we wait on the Lord and we stop working, remember now, if we do all that so that we can rise and run and walk, this all fits, it all flows from a description of God. So here's what I'm going to suggest, and I'm sorry that if it upsets you, because I know many of us can only come on a Sunday morning, but I want to do it tonight. I want to come to this vision of God who doesn't grow weary and who doesn't faint. And in describing him and then talking about waiting for him, we can then bring the day to a close. We begin that day with us and we'll end that day with God. We'll begin the day with our weak and experienced life, either weary and faint or by waiting. And then we can bring the day to a close as we come to God and have our vision of him. To me, that seems the best way to do it. I'm sorry if it doesn't fit, but that's what my thoughts are. Let's do that today as best we can. Let's pray.